Hello and welcome to The Agenda. I'm Stephen Cole and this week we're continuing our look back at the key events of 2021 as brought to you here on The Agenda. During the course of 2021, we've been bringing you the major stories that matter here on The Agenda. The COVID-19 pandemic and concerns over climate change dominated the year, but several other big events were very firmly on our radar. In August, the return of the Taliban following the US-led NATO withdrawal from Afghanistan sent political shockwaves around the world. The prospect of the Taliban back in control, and especially what that might mean for the country's female population, was one of the biggest initial concerns. I spoke to Afghan MP Farzana Elam about her concerns for the future of Afghanistan. You've dedicated much of your career to talking about and working for female inclusion. Are you concerned for the future uh, for women in uh, new Afghanistan? Yes, of course I am, and everyone is, because we, we have uh, uh, an experience of Taliban being... Uh, in control of the Afghanistan. We have that experience from the time and as well as their thoughts and beliefs, the nature of the Taliban, they, the, 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 the way they treat the women. But just last day, they, in these days, when they, they are having some interview, interview and they are sharing that from their addresses, they are covering up the women at, at all. So for the, for the uh, time being, as that's not clear that if they just made some com commitment to the women's rights or not. So I am concerned, and I am so much concerned about what will happen to the women of Afghanistan, whether they will have a right to, to have access to education, whether they will have a right to uh, participate in the society, whether they will have a right to, to do what they want, like their jobs in order to jobs and these things. So, or whether they would be locked on their houses. So you think the future looks bleak? I think for us the priority is not to, uh, not to talk about the way that we dress up or the way we appear in the society. So the thing is that would they allow us to have this access to education, jobs and these things or not? The first important thing, the priority is the safety of the women who are civil activists, who are women rights activists, human rights activists, who are not covering up the way they, the Taliban demand, not saying the Taliban demand, like they, those who are against the Taliban and talking against them and against, not like it's not a, uh, uh, their enemy, but but the, the way the Taliban treated Afghan people and women, the women got a right to talk about that, and they did that. So the the thing is now, even they would be judged by the things that the women said and did in the past or not. The safety and security of the women is so much important in the at the first priority. After that, having access to education, uh, health, and everything that men do. This is so important for us. The hasty American retreat took many people by surprise, as did images of Taliban fighters in the presidential palace in Kabul soon afterwards. General David Petraeus is a former U.S. commander in Afghanistan, and he joined me in September to give his thoughts on the country and the region's future. General, the U.S. State Department insists this has been a success, but to the rest of the world, it doesn't look like one. Indeed, I think you are reported as saying it's been catastrophic. Is that right? Well, I see this as heartbreaking. Uh, it's tragic. Uh, and I don't know how you can describe a situation in which a government, however flawed, uh, but one that supported U.S. and coalition forces on its territory as we attempted to ensure that al-Qaeda could not reestablish the kind of sanctuary it had under the Taliban, when the 9-11 attacks were, were planned there, uh, that is replaced by an ultra-fundamentalist Islamist emirate uh, and the very Taliban who, again, allowed al-Qaeda to have that sanctuary that led to our entry into Afghanistan uh, after the 9-11 attacks. I, I don't know how you can describe that as anything other than disastrous. 
President Biden says the Afghan army had little interest in fighting the Taliban without the backing of U.S. forces, probably um, uh, air, air, air power. You spent a year as head of the International Security Assistance Force in Afghanistan. Is he right? The fact is that 27 times uh, as many Afghans died in combat as did Americans in combat, and we have not had a battlefield loss on the American side in the last uh, 18 months. Um, did they collapse when it was clear that no one had their back? Yep. Uh, what was it that dealt this psychological blow to them? Well, it was the previous administration that insisted on negotiating an agreement with the Taliban that we we're actually fighting um, without the presence of the Afghan government and forced the Afghan government to release 5,000 detainees uh, most of whom were returned to the fight uh, pretty quickly. The question is, could we have had an affordable, sustained, sustainable commitment? I uh, believe that that was an option. It was well, provided. Well, that was already happening, uh, wasn't it? To... That, that's why there were no casualties, and there was a smaller force, of a, a smaller American force, but it was working. Uh, indeed. Uh, look, I have publicly advocated for that for several years. I have said that if you are trying to ensure that Islamist extremists are not able to reconstitute themselves, you have to keep an eye on them. And that was sure help by having, in the case of Afghanistan, bases on Afghan soil, and frankly, in the case of Pakistan as well. It's publicly known that the operation that brought Osama bin Laden to justice when he was in Abbottabad uh, in Pakistan was launched from and recovered to Afghan soil. So the effort now to ensure that uh, extremists cannot reestablish a sanctuary in Afghanistan, and now it's not just al-Qaeda, it's also the Islamic State Khorasan group affiliate that is in the AFPAC region. This will all have to be done from bases that are outside not just Afghanistan, but Central Asia, because we have no bases there either. That will be a tall order, but it is doable. Whether a Taliban government will be able to rebuild Afghanistan is still very much open to question. After several months now back in control, in September, I spoke to the former British diplomat, Sir Adam Thompson, about how the Taliban will now have to reach out to the world for help in fixing the country's shattered economy. I think they will certainly try. I mean, they'd be crazy not to. The United States effectively has a block uh, on uh, IMF uh, loans, uh, World Bank funding, and uh, holds, as I understand it, a, a large percentage of total Afghan uh, uh, cash reserves, uh, which are held outside the country. So uh, the Taliban are bound to try, I think, and that does give Washington, in particular, a good deal of leverage. Uh, I suppose the uh, Taliban will be hoping that if that does not work, uh, friends like China will help to bail them out. But I, I believe, uh, I've, I've already commented on this, that there are figures within the Taliban leadership who would genuinely like a, a significantly different relationship with the West uh, and with the United States. They're not going to compromise on their Islamic values as they understand them, uh, but they don't have to host international terrorism. Uh, they don't have to pump drugs abroad if they're rewarded for economic alternatives to the poppy crop. Uh, they can uh, create the incentives to keep the Afghan population in Afghanistan rather than wanting to flee abroad uh, to the West. Uh, and those things would arguably be in Taliban interest if they want to be a long-term government that lasts more than the five years they managed last time around. And that was Sir Adam Thompson with his thoughts on the future for the Taliban in Afghanistan. Well, 2021 also marked the record-breaking end of Angela Merkel's 16-year tenure as Chancellor of Germany. But the result of September's election to choose a successor was far from clear-cut, and months of political wrangling ensued. I asked a panel of experts whether or not that was proof 
that Merkel had been the glue holding a fractious political system together. She has great ideas of how to, to build up and how to change uh, German's po Germany politics with regard, for example, to, the, uh, to European politics, what to do after the Brexit, how to, how to react. And so I, I think, of course, Germans are missing the, the big ideas for, for the future. And that's, of course, we see when, when we have a look at the, at the voting results and about the results of the different groups of age uh, having taken part at the election. So we have a big difference when we have a look at the younger voters below 25. And when we have a look at them, whom they voted for, they voted not only for the Greens, but also for the Liberals, for the FDP. Uh, so the the biggest uh, 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 the big uh, best results uh, with regard to the younger voters uh, got the Liberals and the Greens. I think that was very interesting, uh, also for the whole public and for the parties to learn this lesson that the younger ones they want to see other. Uh, other types of parties and another type of politics. And the real picture I think that you have to look at is that 75% of German voters will not be behind whoever um, emerges from the coalition government and be the new chancellor. And the uh, old catch-all parties, the so-called Volkspartei, just managed 25, one quarter percent. And the young voters, the Professor Munch addresses, voted for 15% 15, 15 also the Greens or for to 11% for the Liberal Democrats, which is not a huge percentage of the popular vote. I think I'm just left with this uncertainty where Germany's direction in the world lies when 75 percent of voters... But we should note agreed. that we have, of course, we have a totally different election system than the Brit, Brit, uh, than yes. Great Britain. Yes. So I, please I note that that's quite normal for Germany. Of course, in former time, 1960s, 1970s, we only had three parties. Two of them were very, very big parties. We have a changed party system, but of course, we have another society and we we have a proportional part, uh, a voting system, and that's of course something else. So don't make such a big fuss about uh, about this uh, different uh, majorities. So we will yeah. get used to this. That's quite unusual now. Well, but of course, the advantage is we don't have any more this old men making old party politics, but we have now this chance and this necessity uh, that party politics in Germany will change with regard to a totally different German society. Merkel's classic slogan for voters during her campaigns was always, you know me. But did they know much about Angela Merkel? Um, what will her uh, legacy be? What will she be remembered for, briefly, if you will? And uh, I'll ask the same question to Thomas and to Professor Munch. I think she'll be remembered as being the symbol of, of, the, of stability and liberal democracy and all of those values. I'm not necessarily sure that she was that. When, Barack Obama, when Trump won the election, Barack Obama went to Germany, pleaded with her, take another term, she was going to step down in 2017, and she accepted that. But she's been seen as a simple symbol of being sort of the anti-Trump, and I think she'll be remembered as that uh, in the world. Uh, and being a safe pair of hands, which is a good thing. Okay. Thomas? Yes, I agree. Safe pair of hands, continuity, but also Chancellor without a strategic sort of a particular vision. Not a single important speech will be remembered about what she said. She's, <laughs> she she governed by a spreadsheet, as we heard before, but she governed sort of solidly, and, and, and she was a symbol of, of the quiet Germany and the peace and prosperity that people hanker for. That will be gone. We are looking at a more uncertain future now. Professor Munch? Somebody very powerful, of course, but also a woman who decided when she will end her own political career. Staying with Europe, almost five years after Britain voted to leave the European Union, the United Kingdom finally left the bloc on January the 1st, 2021. In April, a hundred days after that, I tried to find out exactly who could be considered the winners and the losers of Brexit? I think the cold, hard realities of Brexit are certainly beginning to sink in on the British side. And I'll give you an example, and that's probably best seen by the smaller businesses 
who have been very badly affected uh, by the overnight change in trade rules from the 31st of December. Um, there's new paperwork, there are new rules, there's a rush to secure uh, delivery space causing widespread delays and extra cost. Um, and I think we have seen the figures, the UK exports to the EU have uh, fallen by a shocking 41% in January. But I think the tensions between the two sides um, have very much magnified their inability to cooperate. And Carol Lanu, the same question to you. Who are the winners and the losers? I think both are losers. I mean, we, we had better stay together and it would have been beneficial for both. And uh, Amy mentioned these uh, figures which have been going around, let's say, about the reduction in trade from the UK to the EU. I don't know about the figures from the EU to the UK, but I think it will be more or less similar. At least I know it for Belgium, let's say, that the trade exports to the UK has, have gone down as both sides have to adjust to the new rules. So I would say we're, we're basically in a lose-lose situation, and that's what you see reflected politically, that the kind of the, um, the rhetoric on both sides is, is growing. Us, basically, they see it's not a good situation for the economy. But of course, we have the, the health situation where the UK has clearly done better, and apparently that's due because the person in charge and those which have negotiated the deal have been much tougher in negotiating with the pharmaceutical sector than we have done on the European side. And the EU has taken far too much responsibility in a subject which is not her responsibility, which is a subject for the, for the member states, for every state. Still to come here on the agenda, shooting for the moon. We'll look back at a big year for space travel. Murray, what would you say is a good question? Stephen, I'd say it's one where there's always more than one answer. The Answers Project is a new podcast series from CGTN Europe. With me, Stephen Cole. And me, Mari Beveridge. In each episode, we'll take a complex question. And with the help of some of the world's foremost experts, shine light on some of the answers. So join us for The Answers Project. Available wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back to The Agenda and our look back at the major news events of 2021. The G7 summit held in the United Kingdom in June was the first face-to-face -face meeting of the leaders of the select club of wealthy countries since the pandemic began. The focus was largely on vaccines, the climate and the global economy. But what did it all really mean for the future of global cooperation? I spoke to three experts to get their views on whether G7 meetings really matter. I want to get a, a thought from each of you, what you think this summit um, says about the future of global cooperation. So, Astrid, beginning with you, signs of global cooperation or global division or global enmity? Which one is it? Uh, perhaps not en enmity, but certainly both collaboration and competition on the table, both between G7 countries and between G7 uh, and China. I think uh, a topic of conversation between us here today has been the missed opportunity to really step into that leadership space and show that democracies can do better. They can be better. They can be better for the environment, for their populations, for human rights. And it's only through uh, leading by action that uh, the US and its G7 allies will be able to step into that space uh, that it wants to take rather than leave it open for China to step into. And Tristan, uh, a missed opportunity or not? Well, there'll be missed opportunities with some issues and not with others. I think where, where there, there was some success uh, was in re-articulating what the identity and role of the G7 is going forward. And, and I echo something that Michael was saying earlier, that this uh, the G7 is beginning to transform itself after at least a decade of sort of relative listlessness into being a club of democracies, principally oriented around the protection and promotion of democracies. Uh, we saw that here this weekend in the rhetoric. We saw this in the invited guests uh, this weekend of South Korea, South uh, Africa, India, and Australia. So that's where I sort of see this weekend leading us uh, in the, the mid to long term. And Michael uh, O'Hanlon, your thoughts about this summer and the future of global cooperation and perhaps global leadership too? Well, I agree with my colleagues. I was also gratified that in the 
discussion of China, the differences and the critiques were specific and a little bit more restrained than we've sometimes seen coming out of Washington. So take, for example, the Uyghur issue in Xinjiang province. I've objected strenuously to the U.S. designation of China as committing genocide uh, in that province. I don't think that's the right word. I think it's unnecessarily inflammatory. On the other hand, I don't agree with everything China's doing in Xinjiang. And I thought the G7 was a little more businesslike, but still resolute and firm and clear in making its views known. So I think the collective voice of these democracies was better than the individual voice from Washington and a little more restrained, which I think is more hopeful for building as much cooperation with Beijing going forward as we can. One of the ongoing stories of 2021 was the global shortage of semiconductors, the chips that control everything from cars to fridges, gaming consoles to rice cookers. The shortage had largely been put down to a surge in demand for technological devices as the world was locked down thanks to the COVID-19 pandemic. But in September, Professor Rana Mitter from the University of Oxford's China Centre explained to me how geopolitics was also playing its part in the global chip shortage. I think the COVID pandemic, Stephen, is a very important factor, and it's clearly massively disrupted supply chains in all sorts of areas. But the geopolitics of this is becoming more and more important as well. When it comes to technology, the United States and China, as two countries, both of which have very strong indigenous tech sectors, are finding that the opportunities for cooperation are becoming fewer, and the sense that they're in competition with each other is becoming greater. So in that sense, semiconductors, which of course are one of the most important components of pretty much all technologies that involve essentially most elements of modern technology, are becoming more and more of an area where both sides feel that cooperation is very difficult. And since the production of semiconductors is one of the areas at the moment where China so far does not have really high quality uh, indigenous production, that's a problem in that sense. So how is this going to play out in the case of semiconductors? Well, I think at the moment we see that there is a short term issue, which is partly to do with the pandemic, in that supply of semiconductor chips across the world remains quite constrained. Essentially, and there are a few exceptions, but essentially for the really high quality semiconductors, the top level ones, you're talking about two places in the world that produce them. One is South Korea and one is Taiwan, because so much manufacturing, so much of the supply chains in many areas of global technology do, do in fact go through uh, China. Now, the question is whether in the short term, as the world comes back to trying to revive the economy, uh, as the pandemic, we hope, begins to recede, is any major actor really willing fundamentally to break up those supply chains? We don't know the answer to that yet, but it seems to me that since the top priority for so many economies, the United States and China amongst them, is to first of all get the economy humming again, smashing up those supply chains, basically trying to uh, either um, in some ways uh, take a, a, an, an unprecedented action which would restrict the flow of semiconductors just seems quite unlikely. So I think despite all the language, we've got something of a status quo in the short term. In the longer term, of course, we'll have to see how the semiconductor uh, industry develops uh, globally. Twenty twenty one has been a big year for big tech, as the multi billionaires behind some of the world's biggest tech companies got richer and it seems even more powerful. In February, the story is all about Facebook when it was unfriended by the Australian government in a row over payment for news content. Each side claimed victory when the standoff, which affected millions of the app's users, was resolved, but that certainly hasn't ended calls for far stricter regulations on the tech giants. So in March, I asked the former Facebook executive in Australia and New Zealand, Stephen Sheeler, just how significant this case really was for the future relationship between governments and big tech. I, I sense that it is a, a precedent setter, right? I mean, this is one of the first um, you know, countries in the world, if not the first, that's kind of gotten the big tech players to this point. Um, around this particular issue, around paying for newsworthy content. So, you know, it's the first golfer in the clubhouse or the, you know, the first cab off the rank, whatever your, your metaphor. And it will certainly, um, you know, uh, it'll draw a lot of scrutiny. It'll draw a lot of comparisons. And, you know, if other governments want to see what the big tech will agree to, well, this is it. This is one thing they will agree to. Maybe they want other co countries want to go further, but 
at least we've seen here, this is how far Australia could get. I mean, it's also provoked the argument that big tech should be more controlled. There should be more regulation, especially on the big five. Should they be more controlled, do you think, and regulated? Or would that stifle innovation and dampen enthusiasm? Yeah, there's certainly arguments on both sides. I think the, the you know the dead hand of regulation uh, can impinge on creativity and innovation, and um, you know it does have that effect. But on the other hand, monopolies also tend to impinge innovation, as far as uh, my, my economic understanding goes. So you know there's uh, there's can be negatives on both sides. You know, tech is so big, and the negative externalities of the internet and social media are are now getting so big and you know and and net we live in a better world because of the internet and because of social media i think the world is better but the negative externalities around data privacy around mental health issues uh, around um, you know democracy and how information flows um, all those things are now big enough that you know we really do have to tackle them i think we've seen that leaving it to self regulation of the industry itself is probably not the right solution in, in and of itself. So I think we do, in some, need a, in more regulation across the board for big tech in different countries. Almost 50 years since an astronaut last set foot on the lunar surface, in 2021, the race back to the moon hotted up once again. China is the country which has most recently been there. The Chang'e's probe touching down at the very end of 2020 to collect samples of rock for analysis. Back in January, Xu Yang Song, director of the China National Space Administration, explained what had been learned from that mission. Well, uh, I think there's a, a great interest in the international community to study these samples. Because of the geographic locations, this region is the newest region on the moon. Um, some uh, one billion year old uh, in comparison with third, uh, three to four billion years old, uh, those samples that has been collected by the so former Soviet Union and U.S. So these samples are, are, are very useful uh, for telling the moon's uh, uh, characters, the volcanic activities and the later stage moon uh, activities. Um, we will uh, distribute the sample to the international community. That is the preparation work we were doing now. How important is uh, global cooperation between say, China and Europe, China and US, etc.? Well, I think uh, global cooperation is essential for exploration missions. The moon is not far away from Earth. Uh, we can have uh, independent missions. But to go further, we need to collect uh, uh, all the strength that we have on the Earth. So the cooperation with European, uh, in particular European Space Agency, has been very successful. And uh, before that, we also have Chang'e 4, which is also open for European uh, cooperations. And four, four countries from Europe, uh, namely Sweden, Germany, uh, France, and, um, um, and, and Belgium, had also participated in, in this mission, uh, putting instruments and payload on board the mission. And uh, we are also looking forward to more extensive international cooperations once we have this opportunity. So uh, this is a, a good opportunity to cooperate with Europeans, with Russians, with U.S. And we do have some difficulties cooperating with the uh, U.S. But with the new administration, I, I certainly believe that the um, uh, bilateral cooperation, the old mechanism between China and U.S. in this civil uh, coordination dialogue forum will continue that the uh, opportunities will be found uh, between the two countries. So globally speaking, China is fully open for international cooperation on the Chang'e mission and beyond. Don't forget you can watch everything from past agenda episodes and find additional exclusive content on our website, cgtn.com slash Europe or on our YouTube channel. And, of course, you can follow us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, at CGTN Europe. Coming up on a future agenda, another year in the life of a pandemic. We'll look back at how the world learned to live with COVID-19 in 2021. But for now, from me, Stephen Cole, and all the Agenda team here in London, it's goodbye. <laughs>